only the best are here, right? Yeah. Thank you guys. You have no idea how important it is to, that you are here. There's 5,000 people later. here, right? And they were recording. So. <laughs> <laughs> session was great. You ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, okay. well, I don't know. Go ahead. He wrote it for me, so I don't know. Okay, so we're ready to go. I thought we were going to have Jim here. Jim's not here. Jim's not here. Jim's so, not okay. here, man. I'm Jim. So I will say uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the final event of SciCon 2024. Woohoo! <laughs> Sunday morning paper session is a tradition here, and after I did my first Sunday paper talk, I wrote an article about my experiences to describe how others could get a spot on this podium. So you can find that article, by the way, in my online skeptical inquirer column, The Well-Known Skeptic, and you can Google it. It's, so you want to speak at Saigon? So I'm going to read to you the introduction, which is describing what this is all about. What is officially called the Sunday morning paper session is a tradition that involves a multi-speaker session on the final day of the conference. Unlike the speakers appearing in the first several days, those who are actually well-known and seasoned presenters, the Sunday morning paper session has developed giving unknown skeptics a turn at this podium. And rather than getting an unsolicited invitation from the conference organizers to, to be a primary speaker, this is a ticket that needed to be earned. So, by the way, little did I know when I wrote that article five years ago that not only would I do three more Sunday papers talks, but I'd be put on the committee with Susan Gerbic to decide who the speakers are for this year. So I'm going to have Susan let you know about some of the details of the selection of these speakers. And we'll learn about this together because Rob wrote this, printed it out, and handed it to me. <laughs> Susan said she's just going to rip it up and throw it away. So. Rob's an engineer. And I am not. So here we go. Sunday morning paper introduction part two. Susan. <laughs> 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 supposed to read that one, Susan. <laughs> Turn up the mic. All right, I got this day. Two left. All right, so I also got my start being a Sunday paper speaker back in year. Oh. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. It is the highlight. When they put Rob and me in charge this year, we decided to update the selection process a bit. So now let me tell you what the six people giving me talks this morning have to do to go through to be here. Okay, now let me, let me add to that just really quick. Let me add a minute. So we were voluntold, not put in charge, and um, that's cool. I was, I was all for it because I love the paper session. You guys are in for a super treat because this is hard work for these people. It is terrifying for a lot of these people. And I'm telling you, I am so proud of them all. And Rob was amazing to work with. So let me tell you, Ken and I are leaning in, not that I believe in that stuff, but it is, it's, he's just very great at details, and he's great at timing, and he's great at being on time, and he holds in task, and it's wonderful, and he prints out papers for me to read. So, so he's really great to work with, and we were on it this year. So. Um, everything down to the last detail, even including their name tags, saying Sunday morning paper, to them receiving wine bottles, to receiving their, their, their names on the website, to the slide you're seeing right now, it's all Rob's work and all his insistence that this happens. So, Rob Palmer is awesome. And we have Rob Palmer is out there, so if you're a Rob Palmer, please, please give me, and I will find you something to do. All right. So, first, the Sunday morning paper people, morning paper people. They had to respond to our call for papers by submitting a proposed topic with an outline. Okay, we moved that deadline up way up because we wanted to give them a lot of time to evaluate. We had some great candidates who, and by the way, I can't see anybody. You're just little tiny globy blobs out there, so you're picking your nose, I won't know. Um, so just FYI. But anyway, so. I just want to tell you that I did not write that last time. <laughs> God, we've known each other a long time now. So um, anyway, so. Well, we had some great candidates. We had to whittle it down and then whittle it down again. But Rob is very like on it, so we were able to, to do that pretty quickly, and we were able to select six great topics, I think. And, we, and you know, it's not only that the people who submitted said, you know, they didn't have um, the 
how I say this, some of the topics were too similar to other things that have been done in the past or whatever. So, so it wasn't, if somebody submitted, it wasn't just that they couldn't, we didn't think they could do it. It's just that we just thought that that topic probably wasn't appropriate right now and I will not fall off the stage, I promise. <laughs> and so it's like sex, uh, an inch away from me. Okay. So then for the proposals we received, we down selected it to eight and then we had to select it down to six. And we asked them all to submit only a slide deck with their talk. And I think that's the past, they didn't do that in the past where I think they were supposed to write an academic, well, like a paper that could be submitted to Skeptical and Wire. So we decided, Rob decided that he didn't like that either because he's gone through this process more than I have. And yeah, so, well, quite often they didn't publish anything. Uh, yeah, so, so it was like, a, it was a hurdle right. we didn't need to have in place. Right, so we didn't want to have to have our people do that. We made them use Zoom to give us a video of the presentation as they had it. And that's where we decided on things. And that way we could see how they would how we could do it. Then and since you're complimenting me, I want to compliment Susan. Susan was the one who worked mostly with the people to make sure the presentation <laughs> was up to snuff in her opinion. Well, I made them do the Zoom screen videos over and over until they probably hate me now. But um, <laughs> okay, so then da, 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 stuff, stuff, stuff. Okay, <laughs> then we get down to six, and then yeah, we picked. And then what changes made today? We have a Q and A session because. What the heck? We're supposed to do this in two hours. And we were like, oh my God, two hours. And I said, let's get 10 people up on stage and give me three minutes each. And we, no, maybe we could do one minute each on stage and we put 20 people on the screen. And then somebody, Kat McLeod, somebody here, she goes, what are you doing that extra hour? I'm like, what extra hour? And she's like, you have three hours. And then I found out that Jim's not here, so we're in charge. So, <laughs> so Rob and I have this. So here's what we were doing the last hour. We we have people sing Ave Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob and I were going to stand here and sway for 30 minutes. <laughs> and he was getting the hand. And then we have a really good friend, Avi. I don't think he's here right now. Avi Springer. His name is Avi. So we were just looking for Maria. <laughs> Get it? Get it? Talk about dad jokes. Okay. All right, one more, more, more. When change you okay? So we're gonna have a Q and A session, and I think Rob, you had some information on that. I don't know. Uh, while so, the speaker is up, please. So, so, so before each slide, we're gonna show the email. So we're gonna do it that way. You can send the email. The subject will see to us, and we'll moderate it. We'll take a few questions out depending on time. Right. So if we have time, we'll, we're gonna do a question after each speaker. So get your you know phone out or whatever. If not, I think we might take a question from there. So we might. I don't know. Like I said, I can't see you. Um, email the questions to psychonpapers at gmail.com. We will read the best of them to the speakers. And without further ado, our first speaker is David Weinberg. So David, come on. So apparently, this is the email to address questions. You are already kind of really blocked out there. All right, first of all, I, I realized I slightly changed the title of my talk between submission and an actual execution, so I, my apologies. Um, first of all, I want to thank CSI. This is my first SciCon for CFI, and especially to Rob and uh, Susan for being such great ambassadors and coaches and cheerleaders for those of us up here for the first time. So I'm going to tell a story, and now I'm going to talk about some less virtuous individuals. Um, this, this is two chap a story, two chapters told over time and space uh, that they're quantumly connected somehow. Uh, this is stories about curing all diseases at least twice. And the first, the first chapter is in the 19th century. And the backdrop of this story is the evolving germ theory of disease. And by the middle to end of the 19th century, germ theory was pretty well established science, but it took a long time. It was almost 50 years before penicillin became available. So antibiotics were sort of the ultimate reward of germ theory. At least that's what they want you to believe. What's not taught in history classes or science classes is that in 1886, this man actually cured all diseases, and he told us he did. This man is named William Radham. He was a gardener from Austin, Texas, and he wasn't a scientist. He didn't have any formal training in science or microbiology, but he was a super fan of germ theory. 
And he had this very promiscuous interpretation of germ theory. He determined that all diseases were caused by microbes. And his gift to us was his micro killer, which he had patented in 1886. Um, and he claimed that he cured all diseases. And it was a tremendous commercial success. Now, how do I know about this? Well, I collect antique medical artifacts. And this is a picture of some of my collection. And his bottle, bottle is highly desirable among collectors, largely because of the images that's embossed on the bottle. It's a little easier to see in the print ad on the, on the right side of the screen. It says Micro Killer. And his logo is our hero in Mortal Kombat with the Grim Reaper. And the tagline, the humble tagline, cures all diseases. <laughs> um, Clearly, Mr. Adam wasn't the only snake oil salesman of his day, but he was one of the most successful. And he was the one who leaned most heavily on germ theory. But all good things must come to an end. After about 30 years of a very successful business, and which enabled him to move from Austin, Texas, to a uh, mansion in Park Inn in New York, uh, the regulations finally caught up with him. The, the first law to really regulate drugs in the US was the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. And then more importantly, the 1912 Shirley Amendment, which prohibited false therapeutic claims. And he was found to be in violation, and that was the beginning of the end of his, interest, of his business. So now that, they, now that uh, Mr. Adam was silenced by the deep state, <laughs> it became necessary to cure all diseases again. So there's a 21st century version of this story. And the backdrop of this is the emerging uh, story of stem cell science. In the beginning of this century, there were some really important discoveries that made, that added a lot to what we knew about stem cells, but more importantly, enabled scientists to, to manipulate stem cells in ways that they could become therapies for diseases. And there was a lot of excitement and hype about this, including the, the late press. Almost every periodical had an issue like this one dedicated to the revolution in stem cells. And stem cells were going to save civilization. They were going to be the fountain of youth and the cure to many diseases. And stem cells still have great potential, but we're 15 years later, and most of those cures are still remain ahead of us. The progress has happened, but the science has progressed very slowly. But that hasn't progressed, and that hasn't prevented a cottage industry and direct to consumer stem cell clinics. Um, and there are many of these. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But this really came to my stark attention in 2017 when this article was published. So it, this one hit me very close to home. I'm a retina special, an ophthalmologist, and I see thousands of patients with a disease called macular degeneration. And it's a, it can be a bad disease, and these patients can be pretty desperate. And this, and I, and I happen to know some of the authors who took care of these patients. Um, this patient, this. This article describes three patients that had macular degeneration that sought care for their macular degeneration at a stem cell clinic in Florida. Put things in context, these women did have a diagnosis of macular degeneration, but they had very good vision. They had very functional vision. They had adequate vision to have a driver's license in their home state. They sought clinic uh, treatment at this clinic in Florida called US Stem Cell uh, in Sunrise, Florida. At the time of these events, the chief scientific officer of US stem cell was this woman named Kristen Camilla. And in the regenerative medicine world, she was somewhat of a superstar. She was a very highlighted, sought after speaker, very loud as an expert in her field. And she was a very vocal and very persuasive evangelist for stem cells. Despite the fact that she was chief scientific officer for a biomedical company, she had no degree in biology or medicine. <laughs> <laughs> at least at that time. She later got a correspondence course. <laughs> well, later she got a PhD from Panama. Oh. Uh, so this is a partial list of the conditions that they claim to have success in treating. And in a uh, interview for a uh, webinar called Miracle Cure, she was quoted as saying that stem cells were appropriate for any organ or tissue inside the body that needs healing. So she was kind of stepping on Mr. Radov's toes a little bit here. So what exact, what treatment did these patients receive? Well, US stem cell favored a treatment called adipose-derived stem cell. And adipose means fat tissue. So these patients paid their $5,000 for treatment. 
They have liposuction performed, so a big needle is inserted into their subcutaneous belly fat, suck the fat out into a large syringe. That tissue is processed mechanically and chemically, put in the centrifuge, and a small fraction of that material, known in the, in the industry as stromal vascular fraction, was, was uh, isolated. They then suspended that in a component of the patient's own blood called platelet-rich plasma. So they had needles stuck into their belly, into their arm, and ultimately into their eye. So this was mixed together, and these, these tissues were processed, but they're not purified. These are, this is, they may contain a few stem cells, and it's probably the wrong kind of stem cell, but it contains all kinds of inflammatory cells, connective tissue cells, proteins, growth factors, as well as some remnants of the reagents they use to process these tissues. So this kind of biological mush is inserted into a syringe, and this is, this is the process that's injected into the patient's eyes. And there's very good indications to inject drugs into the patient's eyes. We do it all the time. But this one had to be tested before. So right, without going into too many details, these patients underwent a spiral of very severe complications. And these women who initially had very good vision, all ended up legally blind within a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and they saw, and this was, they did see care outside this clinic from reputable, uh, very, very high, high quality specialists. And the most severely affected patient lost vision to the point of being unable to perceive light in either eye. Mm -hmm. So, so who's responsible? What, what went wrong here? Who should have stopped this? Well, ostensibly the FDA has a role here. They, they have a set of rules and guidelines about how biological tissues can be used and under what conditions they're regulated and under what conditions they're exempt. But quite frankly, they're pretty ambiguously worded. And what these clinics do is they just interpret them in a way to make themselves exempt. And the FDA has tried to clarify these guidelines, but they rarely stepped in against individual providers. But they did make, a, make a, uh, an exception here, maybe because of all the bad press that this clinic got. So they, expect, they showed up for a surprise inspection in April 2017. They issued a warning letter addressed to US stem cells through Kristen Camilla, and they declared that what their practices were not exempt from regulation, and they cited them for, new, for numerous FDA violations. U.S. stem cell was defiant. They just said they were, FDA was wrong, they misinterpreted their own rules, and that they would continue to treat and fight for their patients. So it took a while, but ultimately the FDA went through the court system and filed legal action against this clinic, and finally the wheels of justice turned slowly, but the judge finally upheld the FDA's action through the courts and finally stopped U.S. stem cell from this practice, this particular practice. The company still exists. The company and Ms. Camilla parted ways sometime after this. So other than the obvious what went wrong, <laughs> um, well, there was certainly lack of regulatory accountability, but when introducing a new treatment to a new organ for a new indication with a new drug or new treatment, there's, there's some steps you usually follow. But they didn't do that. They didn't, no preclinical research, no safety studies. And usually for a new treatment for an eye, since patients have two eyes, you can opt to treat one eye at a time for treatment that's not really well established safety-wise, but they opted to treat both eyes of these patients at the same time on the same day. So I put this all in a category of lack of adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> not only did they not have regulatory supervision, they really didn't have any expertise in this field in their, in their own inner circles. There was nobody with expertise in ocular anatomy or physiology or pharmacology or toxicology, kind of the things you'd want to know. And to the best I've been able to determine, they didn't seek any outside consultation from anybody with those skills. And in Florida, there's lots of people that could have done that. Um, and it's not just that there was lack of safety data, there were affirmative data out there that this was a dangerous thing to do. You know, they usually do a little due diligence before you introduce a new treatment like this, even if there aren't any human studies, maybe there's been some animal work done. And you don't need anything sophisticated to do this. I did this with a Google search. Remember that one of the components of the treatment was called platelet-rich plasma. That had been tested in animal models. Here's a model of rabbits. 
and the pigs. And unfortunately, these rabbits and pigs met the same fate that these women mm. uh, did. So there was really, this, there was good evidence that this was a dangerous thing to begin with. So back to, to make even more depressed. In 2016, when these events occurred, there were 570 directed consumer stem cell clinics in the U.S. In 2021, that number had increased almost fivefold. So there hasn't been much of a chilling effect based on the actions of the FDA in this, against this one clinic. So I hope I can, you can see the parallels between these two events, and it reminds me of this quote, often misquoted to uh, Mark Twain. History often rhymes, and this is the rhyming scheme as I see it. A new science, a very truly exciting science appears in the, on the scene and, and captures the imagination of the public. Unfortunately, sometimes science advances slowly and can't keep up with the high expectations. And a few people representing themselves as the vanguard may make outrageous, seductive claims, but outside the contemporary bounds of evidence, and sometimes patients get hurt, and the regulators really struggle to keep up. If you're, I, there are a lot more details I didn't have time to get into. I wrote three articles for science-based medicine and one for the UK version of the Skeptic magazine if you want to read further. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. information about stem cells if you have any questions there are a couple of good resources the international society for stem cell research has excellent patient excellent resources available to civilians and if you're a little more if you're a little more technically oriented there's a researcher at uc davis named paul Knopfler, and he's a stem cell researcher and he's also been a very vocal advocate for ethical and responsible use of stem cells in the clinic and in the uh and in, in the lab. And he has a newsletter called The Niche. It's got excellent material. It's how I keep up with the, what's going on in stem cells, both good and bad. And thanks again. Okay, thank you. So, um, I think we even neglected to read your bio. So you oh. it. I mean, a lot of it you said, but I'm gonna say it one place here anyway. So, Dave Weinberg, MD, is an academic physician who specializes in diseases of the retina. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. His interest in alternative medicine arose through investigating questions from patients, and he has written for science-based medicine and the Skeptic Online magazine as well. So we did get some questions, so let me read, let me read this. So the first one was, how many folks were treated between the FDA inspection and when the company was prohibited from continuing I don't know the answer to that question. Am I still not there? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if that information is available. Okay. In the two year lag between an investigation being opened and meaningful consequences for Kristen Camilla, is that was that fairly typical? Do you know? I think, unfortunately, I think it is. And I, uh, other than the business shutting down, I don't think there were any consequences to her specifically. I mean, the business. Um, had to stop what they were doing, but I don't think there were any consequences for her specifically. So do you know if the patients got any justice in court? I know that at least two of the patients that I talked about here went through the court, filed civil actions, and I believe they prevailed that they're, they're sealed outcomes. Um, and I know there was another case that were from a related practice of a different clinic that sued and that there were other patients that were harmed as well. Uh, I know that they won, at least one of these patients prevailed in court because one of the owners of the clinic in an interview referred to the fact that they had paid millions of dollars for these patients. Now, this is more of an open-ended one. What is your perspective on what went wrong with Theranos? Yeah. What? Theranos? Theranos. Theranos. Uh, uh, that hasn't been a Yeah, I, 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 I hesitate to. Uh, Okay. All right. What do you think is the next scientific wave to be exploited? Well, I, we've heard a lot of them. I think of already. I mean, AI is the obvious one. You can now get an AI advisor for your supplements. 
No. <laughs> it's true. It's easy to find. And I, I, I think the microbiome thing is a really yeah. hot area now for, yeah. for exploitation. And any, anything you read about in a newspaper, you're going to find somebody taking advantage of. And I think the last question, um, do you know if the FDA has tightened regulations on the stem cell industry? It's been a, it's been a, not really, I don't think. They have, they have interviewed a few more, to, intervened a few more times against individual providers. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a ruling, there was a similar clinic in, in California that FDA had inspected and had ruled against, gone through the courts to try to stop. And the initial ruling by the courts was in favor of the clinic. The FDA lost that case, but on appeal, just a couple of weeks ago, the FDA won the appeal. So the good guys are winning right now. I don't know what the next appeal is going to be. But no, there's been a lot of criticism of the, there's been some criticism of the FDA. Paul Knopfler, who I mentioned, has been very vocal in his, his critique of the FDA. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Bernie Garrett, and why is deceptive healthcare thriving? So, Bernie Garrett is a professor at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing. He has a range of clinical experience from medical and renal nursing practice before he became a nurse educator. He holds a PhD in information science, specializing in education, and holds uh, and, and holds a PhD in um, that specializing in education and artificial intelligence. I was going to have to ask a question about that. He's passionate about science and the author of numerous research papers, textbooks, and the popular science book, The New Optimist, The Rise of Deceptive Healthcare. Bernie Garrett. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to Rob and Susan very much. Appreciated all the hard work you've uh, done for getting us together for this. Uh, but I will correct you on one thing. Uh, I got a call from the grade, uh, and I'm Canadian, so that's up from there. Not Australia. <laughs> 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 I'm going to take a, 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 a bit out of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's and put my book up there that I'm having done just as a, a plug for it. That's the only plug I'm going to do. Um, but uh, and it's not self published on it. Uh, so uh, it, a lot of the stuff I'm going to cover today is in there. And if you want to find out more about it, by all means, uh, look, get the book. But also, you could uh, email me, just Google me on it. And uh, I'll, if you want a copy of the slides today, I'm happy to provide that as well. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, why is deceptive healthcare thriving? Uh, and it's an interesting field for me. I've, I'm a nurse researcher, and uh, as nurses, we're interested in practical solutions and things that help people, particularly researching health psychology, health systems. And uh, I've been looking at this for about the last eight years of my career because I was really interested in why so much health deception is thriving. Heard with examples there. Um, so, if we think about health deception, a good place to start is think about well, what is deception? What do we mean by deceptive healthcare? Well, deception you can regard as a form of communication between two people, uh, the deceiver and the deceived in its simplest form. And there's misinformation, in this case, health misinformation from the deceiver to the deceived person, uh, which primarily benefits the deceiver. Now, this can actually be uh, in the form of financial gain, which is the usual form, but we also see other types of gain as well. So we might see gain that is, um, you know, in terms of fame or other types of uh, benefits to them. But there's also another type of deception that sort of uh, falls between this. There's, there's two basic types. There's um, basically the first type of deception is when the person doing the deceiving actually knows what they're doing is uh, incorrect and false and that's simply lying, and we're very familiar with that. And there's the other type, which is where you have someone who's uh, sort of not aware, and what we call self-deception, that what they're doing and promoting, you know, is promoting false information. Um, there's also, a, as I say, a third type that falls a little bit in between that in academia, which I've come across. And some of you may have come across uh, Professor uh, Harry Frankfurt, anybody can ring any bells, uh, from Princeton, who came up with the term for a type of deception where actually nobody, uh, they don't care whether they're right or wrong, so there's no interest. What they are, are actually interested in is just uh, making sure that they're, they're right and that they, they actually
actually uh, benefit from the uh, whatever they're promoting. And he called this, anybody know? Bullshit. Bullshit, thank you, yes, I can smile on uh, yeah, bullshit. So, and they see it a lot in academia, where people aren't interested in the truth or the falseness of any argument. They're just promoting it because that's that's their brand, and they're, they're going forward with that. Okay. So in Canada, particularly, we see a huge rise in internet uh, health scams and health deception in general. Um, this is from the Canadian Anti Fraud Centre, and it doesn't look that impressive when you look at it because it <coughs> says, well, this is 2023. We see uh, an uptick. The black line is uh, the actual amount of losses. Um, the blue is uh, complaints, and the red is the number of victims. And if you look, it's about you know just over $135,000 lost that have been people that have complained to the Canadian Anti Fraud Centre and made a case against someone who's defrauded them with a health scam. In this case, an internet health scam. However, the, the issue with this is that this is only 1% of they estimate of the actual activity going on. Because most people don't actually report it, they just get on with their lives. Uh, so it's a huge growth area, and we've seen sort of an exponential um, growth in this. And here's some examples for you. Um, these are all in my book, and the, the, I haven't got, there's many more, but uh, the, the first one is that I'm going to sort of talk about, because these crop up occasionally, they're not that common, these unlicensed health professionals. People who are practicing as a health professional with no qualifications. And this guy's one of my favorites. It's Malachi Love Robinson. And uh, he practiced uh, in 2016 uh, in a health clinic and was arrested for practicing under the title of Dr. Love. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as an 18 year old. And he was in a hospital working. Uh, and again, uh, falling back to Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, game, Florida game. Guess which state he was from. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what's going on down there. But uh, anyway, he, he was in Florida and uh, he was arrested. And he served a prison sentence for that, but was actually released. And I believe he's now been rearrested for similar issues since then. So there's not a lot of this, but you get a few cases every year. Um, you read about them because they make the media of um, unlicensed health professionals. Um, more commonly, and the ones we're all familiar, familiar with, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, is uh, actual uh, pharmaceutical malpractice. And big pharma, um, you know, everybody loves to not big pharma, but, but there have been good reasons. I mean, Oxycontin is a particularly uh, classic one, and of course, uh, my colleagues will talk afterwards about thalidomide, and which was in the 1960s, which was again uh, pharmaceutical malpractice because they were promoting a drug which they hadn't adequately tested on the population to be used. So massive amounts of legal uh, sort of malpractice suits against uh, pharmaceutical companies occurred in this case um, are taking place. So there's huge amounts of deception involved in there, particularly things like um, off-book prescribing, where drugs that are approved for one purpose are marketed for another, which they're not actually approved for. And then we have substandard medical products. Uh, breast implants is the most common one that most people think about in this category, where you have these the silicon uh, breast implants that uh, over two million of them were recalled after they used basically substandard silicon in their production to save costs. Um, so this is pretty grim. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of those as well. Deceptive uh, cancer clinics? Uh, yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> Uh, we just heard an example there, uh, stem cells is with new activity in this area. But again, there's uh, two classic ones, the most common, uh, we cited uh, the Vasinski clinic. And it, uh, this is a, a basically a clinic that promotes the use of a therapy with proteins called antineoplastins, which nobody uh, has found to work apart from this clinic, strangely. Mm -hmm. uh, with Stanislaw with Vasinski uh, uses uh, in his therapies and markets this very effectively, still working in Houston and Texas. And this other one is one that's very commonly uh, sort of cited in legal cases, and that's the Hippocrates Health Clinic, which is run by a uh, person called Brian Clemens, Clemens out of, um, again, in Florida. <laughs> and they use many new age therapies and various yeah. other things to kind of cure cancer. In fact, we have a bad example of two kids uh, from First Nations in. <coughs> Uh, Canada was sent down there for um, treatment for leukemia against the medical advice, and one of them actually died uh, after that, um, which was very sad. So they have, they, they, they're still running, um, and there's more, as we've seen, coming up. So deceptive clinics, and particularly deceptive <coughs> cancer clinics, are a boom business. Nutritional supplements, we could spend a whole hour or so talking 
about these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but the, problem, the main problem in this area is that they're regulated differently from uh, pharmaceuticals, and so it's pretty much open season. And you see, you know, I see adverts on the TV this morning for various supplements that can cause, cause me to lose weight and uh, become super healthy. It's absolute nonsense, as we know. And th these are interesting as well, magical health machines. Mm. Um, this little beauty is the Genie 9 Pro. And uh, if you'd like to get hold of one of these, it's an orgone generator. Uh, uh, and uh, it's basically a form of uh, electro, uh, it's, it's radionics, you've probably heard of that. It's, it's, it's electro, electrical magnetic uh, energy that's supposed to produce to cure, cure all manner of things. And this one's at a thousand bucks, if you just want to have to get one. Um, and of course they do nothing. But there's a lot of magical health machines out there from the technology is one of the ways in which deceptive healthcare marketing um, is, is very much uh, used because obviously it sells. Dodgy doctors. Well, there's a lot of those around. Unfortunately, um, oh, it's not yeah. just the alternative health area. It's, we have doctors as well in, um, in radio medicine who once licensed to go off on a trip to uh, actually make as much money as they can. And uh, these are examples of, of these, uh, these two are Sherry Tenpenny, who I think uh, was making a case against COVID-19 that it magnetized the body. Same back in here, here in lunacy. And then you have Joseph McCullough, which we all know, the nutrition uh, salesman who's sort of been listed as one of the biggest threats to health uh, in, yep. in North America. And they might say, hey, they're not medical doctors. Okay, so I'm going to give you this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are medical doctors doing this as well, and of course, uh, Ben has has uh, been brought up legal and lost legal cases against marketing supplements for weight loss, and various other cases have been brought against it. Um, so there's a lot of sort of activity in this area where people are licensed as physicians and legally, and uh, are basically engaging in health deception. Okay, so. Another big category, one that interests me, fake medical research. I'm going to talk about this in a little more. Uh, fake medical research is a big area as well, and of course Andrew Wakefield, famous for linking uh, measles, mumps, and rubella to autism, which is a fair question to ask, because he looked at the, the figures, and that was a fair scientific question to do. But to prove his point, what did he do? He faked his research. He actually faked his results. Um, and uh, used unethical practices in his research to prove his point and was struck off by the British Medical Council for doing that. He's over here now. <laughs> okay, celebrity wellness gurus, enough said. I think well, we've seen enough of those, and as you see, you know, they, they make millions of dollars out of this activity, basically promoting um, fake remedies or alternative uh, remedies that we know actually don't work through evidence. And, uh, or, or simply nonsense. Um, and the big problem now, of course, is social media. And anyone can get on social media and market themselves as a health influencer. Mm. Uh, this uh, lady is known as Montreal Healthy Girl. She's got no health qualifications at all, um, works in Eastern Canada, and uh, has promoted various uh, substances and uh, sales of nutrient, nutritional supplements to, for anti cancer purposes. And she was cured of cancer uh, at Brian Clement's clinic um, in, uh, in Florida. And of course, the one popping up in my, I don't know why, but this keeps popping up in my social feed is chair yoga. How to become really buff with chair yoga. Uh, so you see, your, your social media feeds are all, you know, the algorithms are there, they'll look at your age and they'll, they'll target stuff at you now, very specifically at your age group and demographic. So that's a huge problem. And of course, we have our old friend, Alternative Medicine. I'm not going to go into that. They are a big player in this. This is just a bookstore, actually, this is a bookstore in Washington, uh, where, where I just happened to see all these books about alternative medicine after the display uh, in the health section. Okay, so, you know, the, the, the health, alternative health is a multi million dollar business, as we know. Okay, so why have we got all these problems? Why are they increasing? Well, modern medicine is pretty horrid, let's face it. Nobody likes going to the dentist or the doctor, um, and it's very complicated. So this gives rise to opportunities for deception, as we've seen. The human body is particularly complicated. We don't understand most of how it works still. Uh, we've got a good understanding now of quite a few systems, but if you think of the major communication systems, the neurological system, and 
um, the endocrine system, we've still got very sort of a long way to go before we understand those. Um, and we still don't understand what 30% of the body's proteins actually do. So huge areas of complexity. Um, I'd like to think, you know, astrophysicists have it pretty easy, you know, Pluto is a planet. No. <laughs> <laughs> So one solution to this that we've tried to work through in health, professional healthcare, and this is after a really sort of great uh, figure I, I, of really respect, Archie Cochran, came with this idea of evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine in those days. And this is the idea we have four elements that we need to look at to make sure our medical practice and our healthcare practices in, in any healthcare interventions are well-founded and well uh, uh, evidence. So, we've got evidence from research evidence, and this is the one that causes most concern with people who are you know, arguing about levels of evidence. And of course, at the top, we have multiple studies of uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis of you know, hundreds of studies where we can look at results of those and combine them. They're very powerful evidence that something works or doesn't work. Uh, and then in the middle, we have things like RCTs. People often argue RCTs are the gold standard. They're not, they're actually in the middle. Uh, and the bottom, what do we have at the bottom? Expert opinion, okay? So that expert opinion goes right at the bottom there. Um, so that, that's a research evidence element for us. So any practice should be well worth evidence. And then clinical expertise, what's that about? Well, that is really important as well. We need to know, for example, if we know that an antibiotic, an oral antibiotic, is the best treatment for a specific infection, that's great, unless the patient's vomiting. So we have to find something else. So we use our clinical expertise to find solutions that work. Economic viability, of course, if something costs you know, half a million per dose, it's not economically viable in our healthcare system for, for mass production. And lastly, an important one, patient preference. That's central to all of this. Everybody has a right to choose their own healthcare you know, interventions. And so if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you don't want a blood transfusion, that's okay. That's exactly, you know, that's your right uh, as a patient. So we have to think of all of those things. But the two trouble is when you put them all together, we start to see the problem. The problem is making any health decision uh, requires all of those things together. Uh, if we've only got one outcome for each of them, which is never the case, simple binary, which you've still got 16 possible dis outcomes that you could have from a combination of those four things um, to, to make any single healthcare decision. If we've got you know, three of them, there's 81 possible permutations. If we go up to five, it gets up to 625, etc. We've got this exponential complexity. The more complex things there are and variables in these, making a single healthcare decision becomes immensely complex. And this is why clinical expertise is very important in this as well. So one of the big problems in terms of, we can put them into, we sort of, our research suggests you can put them into two big categories of how these work. Practitioner issues and consumer issues. If practitioner issues, we tend to think of the, this as a particular problem. You're probably familiar with this term, savior or white knight syndrome. You may have heard of that. Uh, now, everybody who goes into healthcare tends to have a desire to help people, and they want, they want people to you know, get better and have a desire to have an impact on improve people's lives, that's what we do it. But there's also, you know, people at the extreme end of this who have this compulsive need to fix other people. Um, they tend also to have an extreme uh, view of their own self-importance. I believe they only they have the answer. They have, you know, the anti-neoplastons, they have the only particular answer, they have the only stem cells that will cure these particular problems. Nobody else has thought of this or figured it out. So they have this uh, sort of belief in their own unique set of skills. Um, they also tend to offer unsolicited advice and seek praise, and uh, Dr. Ross freaks my head there for some reason. Uh, and uh, they often, when you challenge them, what do they come up with? There's a conspiracy theory that you state against them, um, the medical uh, profession, etc. So all of these issues, that's a big problem. We see these individuals running clinics and doing all the other sorts of things that we see uh, in, um, unfortunately, Bad quality research. This is a huge bugbear of mine. I, I see a lot of very poor quality research in bad science in healthcare. 
And uh, as I hope you can read that in these, this uh, Gary Larson cartoon, which I love Gary Larson. Um, it, it says, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark. <laughs> uh, and this is an example of, uh, Cliff Larson points out here, of having multiple treatments in one experiment. You put multiple ex you know, uh, therapies in one experiment, how do you know which one's influencing and influencing the others? Are they in, you know, acting together? Yet yeah, we see loads of research papers with this sort of thing. Um, also, uh, no meaningful comparative control in an experiment. Uh, significant bias in sampling, that's another big issue for us. Uh, testing unfalsifiable hypotheses. For example, we see millions of dollars spent on research studies testing whether praying for people to make them heal quicker after surgery or get pregnant, etc. These are unfalsifiable hypotheses. There's no point in doing those experiments because you're not going to find out you know, any results that are meaningful. Um, false data, weight field effect as it's now known, and predatory and banditry. Publishing is a huge bugbear now. We all get masses of emails every day from fake publications saying, publish with us in our impressive journal. Drives us crazy. Um, this is an example as well of something that uh, watch can. <laughs> <laughs> that you often see in studies. It's on the web list for people to find it. It's a great, very Not the motorcycle is off. That is a pretty impressive cat. Um, but correlation is not causation. And you see that in multiple papers that are put forward. Here's another example for you. This is a, a conference I went to in 2018, and uh, it had a, a, a presentation saying acupuncture was effective in treating joint pain, and somebody had tweeted another great example of how acupuncture can help pa patients with joint pain. So if we have a look at this. If we look at the sample sizes there, the treatment group has tw uh, twice as many as in the two subgroups. And, and this, with statistics, as, as we've seen, they are com complex and they're not intuitive. So they've set up an experiment that's got double the number of people in the treatment group than it has in the sham and uh, the wait list. It's just people who didn't get anything. Sham is sham acupuncture, so they didn't have to get a needle, they got what they thought was a needle, it wasn't in penetrate the skin. So the issue with this is, is it actually biases the treatment group. Uh, I'll give you an example why. If you can ignore the wait list, because the people who didn't get anything, well, we all just know it. If you do a study and you give people nothing and you give people something, the people who get something, you're more likely to get a bias towards that positive response. So you can all ignore that. But the sham and the true, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, true acupuncture, well, if you've got a false positive, which all experiments will have, then say you've got 3%, that's three people in the true are going to say, yes, it worked for me, that's false positive. Uh, but if that's double the size of the sham, uh, who have 3%, three, 3 then you have twice as many in the true actually than in the sham acupuncture. Now that's fine if you can statistically control for that, but people don't, they just compare the two. They say, whoa, look at this, we've got much more people who are responding positively in the treatment group. So this sort of thing is bad science, really. It's very poor uh, levels of um, sort of uh, experimental <coughs> design. Consumer issues. Well, there are some serious ones, and this is what we studied mainly in my area. Um, there, there's a guy called David Modic who looked at uh, a, a psychologist who, who from Cambridge now, and he, he's basically looked at how people are persuaded and, and came up with framework to predict that based on um, psychology. And th there's a number of things here. First of all, positive attitudes towards advertising. People who like advertising are tend to be more easily swayed by deceptive healthcare practices. Liking novelty, if your personality likes something different, that's going to attract you to this sort of stuff. Social influence, that's been a huge one in our studies. We've done some work um, looking at why people uh, engage in high risk alternative healthcare therapies. And social media is massive in the influence of that. Uh, need for self-control, people who like to have their healthcare under their own control and don't trust doctors or nurses or other people saw that in the pandemic. Consistency, not liking changing your mind. If you're someone who fixes an idea and doesn't like to have to be swayed, then that's a problem as well. Uh, and high risk tolerance, and lastly, another one, big one for us, is negative attitudes towards science. Real big problem. Um, this this anti-science movement is real and it's increasing. We, we really need to do something. So what are the solutions? I'll finish up, it's just about out of time or whatever. 
Um, there's two categories I could say here, education and regulation. So in education, we really need to focus curriculum on criticality in higher education. It's sort of been lost a lot of undergraduates and graduate degrees now, I find even. Um, you know, this focus on um, scientific reasoning um, and, you know, what's deductive and uh, inductive, deductive logic and, all, you know, logic fallacies, all that sort of stuff, it's, it's not in the undergraduate curriculum a lot now. Uh, we need to explicitly teach about bad science and deceptive health practices. If you're aware of what this is, you can look out for it and understand the psychology of persuasion. That should be in the curriculum as well. Uh, research, research methods really need to be a bit better. If we're teaching researchers, medical researchers, nurse researchers, any health profession, um, they need to be able to recognize deceptive studies like the examples I've given and uh, also avoid predatory and mandatory publication. Lastly, on the regulation side, Advertising standards really need addressing. It's a real problem. I mean, I come from the UK where they're not allowed to market drugs in an adverts on the TV or radio. It's great. You don't see these, uh, you know, uh, fake physicians popping up with, you know, uh, these methods that are drugs and nutrients they're selling. Um, also, I know people love you well, it's the deep state trying to control us, but it, it really works. Improved advertising standards goes a long way. Um, stop accreditation of bogus health degrees. There's so many, as we said, you know, online health degrees and doctorates we can get. Uh, actually, in the US as well, I hate to say there's some of them. Um, in, and lastly, I'd say as well, really important to improve professional codes and standards and disciplinary procedures. If uh, health professionals go off the rails, their colleges need to do something about it. They need to be suspended or struck off. You know, we're very lenient now. It's very difficult to get struck off. Uh, not that I've tried, but <laughs> it's actually you know, something that uh, you, you, know, you have to sort of virtually uh, be someone else to be a mass murderer or something, in many cases, you've got to actually remove from the register. Usually it's a slap on the wrist and a fine and uh, a year of suspension. So removing problem practitioners from practice early is essential too. Okay, that's me. I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Thank you. We have a lot of questions. So <laughs> even on a small bit of them, but I'm going to read the first. This is the most intriguing one. Perhaps that cat was telekinetic. How can you prove it wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought of that. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's an unfalsifiable hypothesis. <laughs> I think they could have submitted to the IIG. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In my community in the US, it often takes months to get an appointment with a doctor, especially for a new patient. I've been told there's a shortage of physicians. Do you believe this is true? And could this be contributing to the popularity of these alternatives? Absolutely, I mean, uh, that's a problem. For us in Canada now, we have, uh, you have them in the States, nurse practitioners, um, you, you know, nurse anesthetists here. So, you know, using multidisciplinary approaches, and particularly nurse practitioners who can help in you know, GP, uh, in general practice, and primary health care is really important. But of course, we need more physicians as well. It's a terrible problem in Canada. Um, we've, got ma we've got two medical schools in the whole CC where I come from, uh, and there's a huge shortage uh, of physicians. And it does, yeah, it drives people to look at alternatives. Okay. Um, do you see many deceptive practitioners using religion as a shield? And the person who wrote this says, I've dealt with one whose Texas clinic was aligned with a group called the Pastoral Medical Association, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't come across that one, but religious um, ideology is the basis for rejecting medical practices is very common. <laughs> And uh, again, it is exploited uh, by, the, by people who are marketing deceptive healthcare. Um, they will tailor it to match particular uh, religious demographics. Okay, a multifaceted question here. I think this will be the last step. What are the highest value, most achievable changes that could be made to address your concerns? I'll let you have that one first. Uh, well, as I say, I think the most high value is from advertising regulation and better professional regulation because our professional regulatory systems are not the most effective. And lastly, I'd also say um, stop licensing uh, alternative health practitioners uh, uh, with independent. Yeah, that they need to be you know, controlled better uh, than just you know, having their own professional license. And the follow-up to that was, 
are our watchdog institutions in this space adequately staffed to monitor, investigate, and deal with the liars, self-deceivers, and bullshit artists? Yeah, well, I can't speak for the U.S., but definitely not in Canada. Um, you know, we've got two ways of complaining: advertising standards and uh, anti-competition -com bureau. And really, you know, they just anybody who's found guilty gets a slap on the wrist and gets their name on the website, which nobody probably ever finds, um, rather than you know serious repercussions and financial penalties. So yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay, thank you. Another hand for Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, great so far, huh? Thank you guys for all showing up. Really appreciate it. This is the best part of I got. I, I'm a little prejudiced at this, right? So our next speaker is Sue Arachi. She is going to be talking about why we should trust her. No, I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> she's an Australian. Oh, and I apologize for calling you all story. I don't know if instead of calling you a um, comedian, but all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. Sue is an Australian board certified emergency physician who first found the skeptics movement while investigating anti-vaccination groups. She subsequently joined Friends of Science and Medicine and has become part of the broader skeptical movement. Sue spends far too much time on social media and enjoys an argument far too much. And I should point out she is wearing the beautiful uh, Richard Saunders origami earrings today mm -hmm. and she is a wonderful, lovely person. So Sue, go on up. And great shoes. Thank you for the introduction and thank you both Susan and Rob for um, helping me to be here today where I'm amongst friends, old and new, and I feel really comfortable in this um, environment. So it's great to be here and great to see so many people turn up for Sunday morning and hide the No, I'm using the my talk today is some sharing of information that I bring from my background to share with you and it's about one of the many tropes that are seen in pseudoscience and the sharing of false information. What we're going to go through today is some of the common ones and I'll help you think through where these tropes came from and how we can deal with them. This is probably one of the ones that many of you will have heard and certainly I hear it. How is it that you're credible being a medical practitioner? Why should I listen to anything that you say since doctors used to tell people to smoke? Finally, you don't hear a lot of engineers used to tell people to listen to transistor radios, but uh, <laughs> there's sort of an understanding that life has moved on in many different areas, but this one seems to stick. So therefore, if bad things happened in the past, how can we trust what you say today? And my purpose for being here today is to share with like-minded people the knowledge that I have from my own daily life. And to give examples, I've learned a lot from this community in other areas where other people have expertise. <coughs> so for example, from Susan and from the wonderful Mark, I've learned about group vampires. So I, I figure I could do a pretty good cold reading, except that, that was done last night, so I won't bother you again today. <laughs> and from the people who study UFOs and people that study the way videos are falsified, because those people have shared their knowledge with me, I can now go out into the community and help spread that information and bust those myths. So my purpose is to share with you the ones that I know about so I can explain the background and the logic. So when I was thinking this through, I thought, how can we classify what's going on when people are spreading this sort of mythology? And first thing is that Nearly everything in life, whether it's the way we construct our government or the way that we run a health system or the way that we produce self-driving cars, 
it are imperfect models because everything in humanity, all of knowledge improves over time. So almost everything that existed before gets refined and built upon over time. The next thing is, as you all know, that we can only ever do things with the best available knowledge at the time. So all of those ancient philosophers didn't have modern science. So Hippocrates, who's considered to be a great thinker, only had human senses to work with. So his theory about humans in the body turned out not to be true. We don't say, why can we believe Hippocrates? Because he was a man of his time. And as a result of human endeavor, clearly information about everything improves over time because we're always building on what we had before and adding and refining. So as a consequence of that, because we know better, we do better. And that's, that's human progress in general. So I picked three stories to take you through these principles and also give some information about how all of this um, fits together. Thalidomide, uh, the North America, I think, was fairly fortunate that thalidomide was never approved here for use in early pregnancy, but in a lot of the world it was. Tobacco you know a lot about, and I'll talk a bit about peptic ulcer disease as an example of a uh, medical dissenter who actually used the right methodology to, to change practice. So the first story I want to tell you about is Dr. William McBride, who was an obstetrician in Sydney back in the 60s and worked with a senior nurse, the, basically the senior midwife in the labour ward was known as Nurse Sparrow. Someone in the labour ward where he was working noticed, I think it was a, a nurse or a midwife, noticed that there were very severe um, limb abnormalities arising in a range of children. And it turns out that someone made the connection that those were children whose mothers were treated with thalidomide for nausea in pregnancy. He took that information and reported it. Originally that was rejected and then it changed the world. Now, there's still a legacy group of those people with very bad limb deformities, but no more children are, are coming up with that problem. In an unrelated story, McBride went through uh, that unfortunate progress that some medical stars go through, which is to then overinflate his own importance and falsify science. But you can look that one up. Next, I want to put that in context. So, that was the 1960s. In those days, there wasn't an understanding of deformities evolving in early pregnancy. We didn't have this science that we now call teratogenesis, which as you can see there, basically, that's why we study, study Latin and ancient Greek. <coughs> Not much at all anymore. Um, so that's how recent that science is. Obviously we know things like anatomy from hundreds of years because that's an observational science. Whereas the science of how fetal abnormalities developed is fairly recent. So if we apply those four principles to this story, an imperfect model, clearly if any of you have been pregnant, and I think there's a probably 50% of the audience may have been, um, <laughs> you know that we're very cautious now about anything that we do in early pregnancy, whether it's drinking alcohol or taking any kind of medication, that wasn't the world at that time. In those days, it wasn't understood. A lot of women were encouraged to smoke, for example, to maintain weight. So what was happening then was people were using the best available knowledge. And as you know, since then, the knowledge about what influences the health of the fetus is grown enormously to the extent that many people would hardly ever take a, a Tylenol for a headache. Now this is a big one and I guess many of you will have heard people say, well how can we trust the medical profession because doctors used to tell people to smoke. Tobacco has an ancient history in this continent, I'm sure most of you know it, but Tobacco had, like most verbal things, is a very complex range of chemicals. It's not purified and dose standardised. So tobacco is an appetite suppressant. 
we know that a lot of people self-treat anxiety with, with tobacco, especially with the nicotine. And in those days, we also hadn't developed the, the, pro, the practice of medical ethics to the extent that we have now. Not only medical ethics, ethics in the whole of the world. So we know that in the past we had slavery, we had extreme racism, we had a whole range of ways that human ethics were, were developed. And medicine just reflected the way that that is working. Can you imagine this now arriving in a publication in New Port Morris? Those original tobacco companies are still there, still promoting vapes and also moving into what we call the industrial determinants of health. Gambling, alcohol, and the whole new revival of cigarettes into vaping. So if you're interested in all of that, look up the industrial determinants of health, which are adding now to the socioeconomic determinants of health. So why did this happen according to my principles? Well, believe it or not, health workers are human. We're subject to influence and bribes and promotion. And that's why medical ethics now stress that people shouldn't be influenced financially or should declare the things that might potentially affect the way they behave. Obviously, we didn't have a lot of toxicology knowledge in those days. So again, people were doing the best with what they had. And now that we know better, we do better. And if, if there's anything that's changed the health status, particularly across the wealthy world in the last probably 50 years, it would be reduction in smoking rates. And when you hear about cardiovascular disease being controlled, smoking cessation has had a huge effect on reducing that. This is an interesting example. And many of you will have heard about the fact that we used to think that stomach ulcers were caused by so-called stress. Now we know from good evidence that they're mostly caused by an infection by an organism called Helicobacter. Barry Marshall was a health zealot in the sense that he developed a theory and he wanted the world to change practice. But the important thing about Barry Marshall, who came from a very remote place in Australia, is that he didn't just say, I'm right, you all have to change what you're doing. What he did was produce the evidence, which then was replicated, and then did go on to change practice. So again, once we knew better, we started to do better. And this is an important point, and you'll find that many of the shonky practitioners who then get disciplined will say, well, they're trying to silence me and they think that they're a Galileo because nobody's believing what they're saying. What you should be is a Barry Marshall, which is put your money where your mouth is. Literally, he swallowed Helicobacter, had tests that showed that he had developed stomach ulcers and therefore practice change. <laughs> so it's not enough to disagree, you also have to prove that you're right. And putting this in context, for example, of refusal of COVID vaccines, there's always a tension between medicine being too slow to adopt new ideas versus everyone saying COVID vaccines weren't tested for long enough. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah. One last point that's not exactly related, but I have to tell you this one. How many times have I heard doctors only get one hour of usually nutrition in medical school. Yeah. You show you hear that from someone who's never been there, and I have been. So <laughs> let me tell you about nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> nutrition education starts in anatomy when you learn the structure of the muscles of mastication, the tongue, the, the glands that produce saliva. And then you learn how you swallow. So you learn everything about how, um, Angie's agreeing with me here and nodding. <laughs> You learn the biochemistry of how digestion works. You learn about deficiencies. You learn about replacement. There's a huge amount of all of these. There's no such one hour for nutrition. 
I couldn't resist school money leaving you with this one. <laughs> My main message, thank you. <laughs> doing research which actually develops new therapies and that's why many of us are healthy today. I think the best way of doing that, and I'll preface that by saying you don't convert the zealots, but you convert the bystanders. So people who are listening in on conversations, either online or in a group when you're speaking, it's the people who don't yet have a strong opinion but who will learn from your answer. And the answer is, a combination of what I said about the context, the knowing better, the doing better, and then comparing with other industries. So the fact that someone's, some car gets um, cancelled because the airbags don't work doesn't stop you from driving down the street. Yes, isn't this beautiful? Um, a friend of mine has a model for this, which is that it's like witchcraft. And there's a sense that because the press tends to report either the bad end or the extraordinarily good end of scientific advances, there's this sort of duopoly that we're held as both angels and devils at the same time. So if you're held to the standard of a new miracle, and Surely there are, there are many, many almost miracle advances happening in medicine at the moment. It's like if you then seem to be human and fail that you're like the angel has fallen. And I think that's why there's that geopathy that medicine's this fantastic miracle science but at the same time uh, um, there's suspicion. Okay, thank you very much. Jack had his second hand from Spain and the boots are from Australia. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so questions. First question, first question. How, how can we defend science-based medicine when so many pharmaceutical companies have poor practice? I come across that question all the time. And uh, I have to declare that my daughter works for a pharmaceutical company doing research which actually develops new therapies and that's why many of us are healthy today. I think the best way of doing that, and I'll preface that by saying you don't convert the zealots, but you convert the bystanders. So people who are listening in on conversations, either online or in a group when you're speaking, it's the people who don't yet have a strong opinion but who will learn from your answer. And the answer is, a combination of what I said about the context, the knowing better, the doing better, and then comparing with other industries. So the fact that someone's, some car gets um, cancelled because the airbags don't work doesn't stop you from driving down the street. Yes, isn't this beautiful? Um, a friend of mine has a model for this, which is that it's like witchcraft. And there's a sense that because the press tends to report either the bad end or the extraordinarily good end of scientific advances, there's this sort of duopoly that we're held as both angels and devils at the same time. So if you're held to the standard of a new miracle, and Surely there are, there are many, many almost miracle advances happening in medicine at the moment. It's like if you then seem to be human and fail that you're like the angel has fallen. And I think that's why there's that geopathy that medicine's this fantastic miracle science but at the same time uh, um, there's suspicion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
morning. And nobody started the wave, so that's great. All right, so Daniel Reed, he's going to be talking about critical thinking. And the interesting thing about this is when he first pitched this, I was not right on here. When he first pitched this talk to me, um, I was, uh, you know, I, I thought it was great. But as this happened, so we started, I think, in May, when we started pitching these stories, you know, and they had to submit. And over time, he kept saying, um, you know, messaging me and adding something to it. People, you don't understand. He's in West Virginia, and he's almost by himself in the sketchy community. He thinks, but when he started meeting new people. But um, when he said he was going to start a group, a skeptical group in the area, um, I said, go for it. This is great. Katie Bill was really supportive as well. And I think that's how we got the idea. But the thing is, is that he, he, he's doing these workshops, and he's doing these wonderful things. And now they're calling him. The libraries are calling him to come in and do classes on cryptids and all this awesome stuff. I'm very proud of him. And the thing is, is that um, um, I kept asking him to add to the slides, add that to your slides. Tell everybody about that amazing stuff. So I can't remember if it's in the slides or not, so I want to make sure I get a chance to say that to you. So here's what Rob wrote for me, or somebody wrote for me. Daniel Reed is the founder of West Virginia Skeptic Society, a contributor to Skeptical Inquirer magazine and website. During the day, he works as a counselor. In his free time, you can find him giving lectures around the state on the importance of critical thinking and skepticism, as well as investigating industries and strange and unusual. I do have a YouTube channel called Psychics Explained, and uh, Daniel was kind enough to come on to my podcast once to talk about therapy, um, how psychic mediums are not um, therapy. And that was wonderful to have his, his thoughts on that, so if you want to check that out as well. So I give you Daniel Reed. Hey, everyone. Uh -huh. And I thank everyone that made this possible. Susan, Rob, Barry, Kenny, Celestia. There's there's a, there's a lot of people that went together to to actually show a lot of support for this this project. And uh, when our group first started getting together and talking about things that we would like to possibly undertake, batting around some ideas. Uh, our group, of course, being the West Virginia Skeptic Society, we hit upon this idea of creating a day where we celebrate critical thinking awareness and the, the impact that critical thinking has in each of our lives. And we wanted to give folks the opportunity to celebrate that day. So we started, we checked into it, and what we wanted was something that was more official, something that was not, because you can go to these websites um, and you can request a day. So like the, the national talk like a pirate day. You can do that. So you go to those pages and they charge you what I found to be like $900 to get your day just listed on their website, right? So we wanted something a bit more official though. We wanted something that was um, had some gusto to it. And so we checked into it and we found out that such a thing could be done. And we submitted everything. And then, after we did that, we waited. <laughs> and we waited. <laughs> and eventually we forgot. <laughs> now, if you are out there and you get the Doctor Who reference about forgetting to get extra points, it, of course it's like these line isn't anyway, the points never really matter. But yeah, you get you get extra points if you know, you know. Alright. So one day, when this what seemed like one eternity later, I came home from work. And so I go to my mailbox, open up my mailbox. I reach in and there's this huge envelope. And I mean, I don't get letters this size on a regular basis. And I pulled it out and it was addressed to the West Virginia Skeptic Society. Well, the first thought that went through my mind was, oh Lord, we're getting sued. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who we irritated, but I'm afraid we're getting sued. So I, I reached in and I pulled it out and I was looking at it. And so I kept looking at it, and I thought, what, what is this thing? 
And so I opened it up, and sure enough, on the inside, when I pulled it out, was our proclamation. <laughs> Sunday, Governor of the State of West Virginia, for February, February 15, 2024, he proclaimed Critical Thinking Awareness Day for that day, and it was official. Now, the thing about this day is, it was just that day, so we have to renew it every year. <laughs> But it's okay, it's okay. Because we've done that. We've started the process and there's no reason why it won't be proclaimed again. So it's, it's a process that you have to go through in order to get it to be, uh, to the point where eventually, you know, theoretically, it will be proclaimed on a permanent basis. So there's a, there's a process. So having said that, this was the day. Here we had it, I was standing there at my mailbox. My wife was over in the vehicle looking at me, wondering what is he doing, looking at that thing. But, so, it was real. So, have, my question is, have you ever watched the, the Looney Tunes episode uh, of the Roadrunner where the coyote actually catches the Roadrunner? <laughs> have you seen that one? Yeah. So, what happens is, for those of you that, there's, they're running, okay? They're running along, the coyote's chasing the Roadrunner. And so, there's this big pipe, and the, the coyote, runs into the pipe, runs into the pipe to start going along, and the roadrunner goes on the outside of the pipe. So when, with the, all the magic and the wonderful physics of, of, of cartoon um, existence, when the coyote comes out the other side, he's wee tiny. But the roadrunner is still normal size. So the roadrunner comes over and stops. And so the coyote comes out, and he grabs him. Right? <laughs> And so the roadrunner looks down and gives him this rather loud beep beep. And the, the coyote then sort of takes a step back, breaks the fourth wall, and holds up a sign that says, or signs that says, okay, well, guys, you always wanted me to catch him. Now what do I do? That's the feeling I had holding this proclamation. Because prior to this, we just checked into it to see what it was required for us to do. We hadn't actually done a lot of stuff. I mean, we batted around some ideas, but we didn't have anything solid because we didn't know if it would actually be approved or not. And we didn't know how long the process would take. So, the point is, there is no point in having a day proclaimed if you don't have activities for that day, right? Ooh, you got a day, you're doing nothing next. <laughs> so, and the other thing that you have to keep in mind is there's there's no point in having activities if no one knows about them, right? So, for us, that's when the work began. Now, we began looking for resources, things that we could direct people to in order to be able to celebrate Critical Thinking Awareness Day. Now, I was familiar with the work of Generation Skeptics, and so I wanted to direct people to that website and direct people there for potential activities. But I was also familiar with the work of my friend, Melanie Tracy King, and I reached out to her and I said, hey, can we direct folks to you and to your stuff and connect there? Absolutely, she said, and so we did. There's a fellow by the name of Ronald Crouch, who has uh, the unbelief, Dr. Dad, raising a skeptical kid. He had activities on his website. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, can we direct some folks to you, connect people to you? He said, absolutely, he said. And there was this other guy, um, I, his, um, his name escapes me at the present, but he had, a, he had a movie or something about um, <laughs> a UFO. <laughs> Brian Dunning, who gave me permission to use this video. Um, he, I, I reached out to Brian and I said, can we connect to your resources? Can we, and yes, absolutely. And Brian even gave me permission to uh, make movie posters out of his graphics and for the specific university that took place, took part. And we actually had two universities in the state that did screenings of the UFO movie. So, so, 
we got all of our sources together. And so our webmaster, Tim Vickers, created a web page on our, on our website. And what we did, we broke them up, sort of following the, the lead of the Generation Skeptics website. We broke them up by category, category developmentally. So we had a little description, and you know, looking for ways to celebrate critical thinking day, look no further. Um, we had the descriptions of the activities, and we had them broken down by elementary school, by middle school, by high school, for universities and colleges, and for libraries, and then we had a category that was just for anyone. And so we wrote a little description, and then, then we had a, a button, people clicked on the button, and they were instantly transported to the Generation Skeptics or the Thinking is Power exercise, uh, and respectively all the rest for those activities. So we had things for people to do, right? Because there's all kinds of stuff out there. We were just going to direct people to them. Now, after that happened, we started creating social media posts, getting information out about the day, things that we could do to promote. We also created flyers, handouts, things that we could actually print out and put into people's hands or email them the PDF so that they could get that information. And then we started emailing, and we started making phone calls, and we started making contacts. And eventually, what happened, you may ask, but first, who did, who did you contact? Well, we looked at, we sent things to elementary schools, we sent things to high schools, universities, libraries. We contacted the news media. And I even went so far as to email some of our state delegates to get them involved and see if they would help to promote. We ended up getting a university involved and they created a celebration at their institution. We sent stuff out to the news. Uh, we hit the local uh, television stations, radio, newspapers, so on and so forth. And lo and behold, the more we did, the more we actually, it was like a snowball effect. The, the more it was promoted, the more it got promoted. And this particular article, this last one, that is from the largest newspaper in our state, uh, the largest circulated newspaper in our state. And um, it actually has circulation in Ohio and Kentucky as well. So word got out. And in this little box, the, the specifically using the Bigfoot uh, notation of finding this is where you should look uh, the red, the red outline. Uh, this is a segment in one of our uh, state delegates newsletters that she sent out to all the newspapers in the area that she covers um, promoting critical thinking awareness day. And so after that it was born. Critical thinking day awareness day happened. We had colleges, universities, and we had some schools that took part in it, and it happened. It was a thing. So, so, hopefully you all are sitting back there in the audience, and you're thinking to yourself, self, how can I start a critical thinking awareness day in my state? At least I'm hoping that's what you're thinking. So, that's what I would like for you to do. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Getting a date proclaimed wasn't really that difficult. Now, shh, don't tell anyone. Another Dr. Here. All right. How do you do it? You just ask. Many of the governors of the different states, the websites that they have, there's a place on the website that you just simply go to the governor's office and you fill out a request for proclamation. You put in the relevant information, you provide a little bit of background information on your day that you're wanting to proclaim, and you click submit, and it's done. Now, there are some rules, there's some regulations. So for example, you can't request a day that has anything to do with a commercial venture. So you couldn't have a Nike just do it day proclaim. 
they, they, they would go for that. And, you know, as much as I love my wife, um, <laughs> our picture from last year, it's like, um, I could not say I would like an Anne Reed Appreciation Day as much as I do appreciate her. And she will kill me because she does not know that this photo is in this presentation. <laughs> she will now. She will now. I'm sure it's being photographed and sent to her even as we speak. <laughs> Nevertheless, so if you never see me again after this, you will know why. So, you can't do that. It can't be of a personal nature. It has to be something that is contributing to the overall good of society. And it has to be something that is of value that, that people, irrespective of whatever background that they might have, um, can celebrate. So, but if you are interested in doing that, the foundation is there. I wrote an article for the Skeptical Inquirer online that outlines and details the trials and tribulations that we went through in order to be able to make this thing a reality. Um, for example, uh, we go through when we talk about the steps that, or I go through and talk about the steps that we took. I go through and talk about the, uh, the help that I had. Again, I, I point to Celestia. She taught me so much about writing a press release. Um, there's, there's so many people that are so supportive of this, and I'm hoping that if you decide to do that, that the one thing that I ask of you is that you do it bigger and better than we did, okay? That's my one request, because honestly, it's not that difficult to get it, and the foundation is there. We are working on making it bigger and better this year. I have been doing a number of presentations over the course of our, over the, our state on everything from curious about cryptids to investigating ghostly claims. I did a presentation at the a career technical education um, workshop for CTE administrators to spread the word about in, in critical thinking, teaching critical thinking in CTE courses. And of course, I'm here talking about it as well, trying to promote the idea of celebrating critical thinking or Day. So if you are interested, we have more libraries this year that's going to be participating. I actually, through the one meeting, through the CTE Administrators um, Conference, I was able to make connections and get the West Virginia State Department of Education uh, involved, asking them for their assistance, and they've agreed to help promote the day. They have to be careful uh, because of you know, government sorts of stuff. But they said they would gladly help us get the word out. And so if you are interested in doing anything like this, I am at your disposal. So here's my contact information. Uh, there's the, the article for the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. There's my personal uh, web page. There is our West Virginia Skeptic Society Facebook page and my email address. If I can be of assistance to any of you in, in helping you get a day started in your state, I am at your service. Critical Thinking Awareness Day differ from the National Day of Reason? Well, I don't know that it does so much, and except that the National Day of Reason is, it seems to me, to be a more reasonable day. <laughs> <laughs> this is a more, this, this one more critically examines the reason yeah. by which you are reasoning. <laughs> Okay, so this was a very generic, open-ended question. I'll try to narrow it a little bit because it says basically in the universe. No, is the day for proclamation only valid for each state? Can it be proclaimed, let's say, nationally? That well, that actually says worldwide. That's that is actually my hope. Is that the more people that we could get to do this, then um, maybe we could get a national day, of, a, a, a critical thinking appreciation day recognized nationally. It's, it's going to take some work to do that, but that's actually my goal. Um, that's why I'm here talking to you all, uh, is to hopefully make that a reality. Okay, and what do you ultimately hope will come from a critical thinking awareness day? World peace. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, at least not all of this, 
Then, <laughs> and you all know what this is. I'm not going to say it. Um, but my gosh, wow. I just haven't got the words or the time or the, to, to, to expound upon why critical thinking is so important. Um, and we haven't seen anything this whole weekend that would have to do that. No, right. But that's, that's our echo chamber. And hopefully this takes it out into the world where I'm telling you, when, when some of the students that I've spoken to, when they have engaged in these activities, some of the teachers that have engaged in these activities with students, they love it. They love these things. They And it really, I have had people come up to me and say, you know, I hadn't thought about that that way before. And for me, that is that means so much because it just, Sometimes you feel like you're, you know, this lone crazy man out into the wilds of West Virginia, <laughs> waiting this, this, this critical thinking awareness flight. Then you have somebody come up and say, you know, I'm actually thinking about things a little differently because of something you said. And that that means that makes all the difference in the world. Fantastic. And last question: What would you do differently if you had to do this all over? I, if I had it to do over, I would start with having activities laid out at least some before and, and not wait so long until I, we see if we got the neighbor planned. That was a lot of work that happened. Even though we're just going out and, and, and saying, okay, can you use your stuff and then directing people to it, getting that all together and getting it in a, in a format where people can easily access and, and getting the word out about that was that was taxing. Okay, thank you again. Right, thank, thank you. you. skepticism in science museums and um, I'm going to start out with an anecdote uh, which is that this um, this spring my family and I we went to Chicago we went to the Field Museum in Chicago to uh, it was for spring break and so we, uh, we they had this exhibit there called Blood Suckers Legends to Leeches and the exhibit talked about mosquitoes and biting flies and ticks and vampire bats and leeches, of course. Um, it also had uh, it had uh, exhibits about uh, bloodletting and the history of uh, barbershops. And it had uh, a lot of uh, popular culture stuff about vampires. Uh, pretty interesting exhibit. Uh, one of the other exhibits that it had was about a chupacabra. Hey. And um, so, so this is one of the exhibit panels that it had, and it shows the newspaper clipping of um, of the uh, the newspaper where the chupacabra was first described. Uh, this woman, Madeline Tolentino, uh, was an eyewitness to uh, this creature. You can see the little picture of the creature um, in in the, the article there. And it, and in addition to this, they also had. Oops, wrong way. They also have this model of a chupacabra. <laughs> you can see it's a, a little bit different from the other creature, and that was kind of their point. Um, let me read you, to you what it says on the panel. It said, in Puerto Rico in 1995, residents found farm animals drained of blood. 
<clears throat> with no apparent explanation for such a terrifying loss of livestock, a report blamed a newly conceived creature called El Chupacabra, literally goat sucker in Spanish. The creature was described and illustrated on the front page of a newspaper and the story spread. Alleged sightings occurred across the nation and into Mexico and the southern United States. <clears throat> and since then, hysteria has spread and the blood sucking chupacabra is now depicted in both fantastical and frightening ways quite different from its original description. Okay, so that's what they said about, about, about the chupacabra. That was it. That was the end of it. Um, you can see it. This kind of looks like a hairless uh, dog with spikes coming out of its back. Um, what they didn't say was that Benjamin Radford wrote an entire book about the chupacabra. Um, and, and, you know, as we talked about yesterday, what, what isn't said is also often important. And um, so what they left out from his book is that um, this creature in the movie Species is very similar, surprisingly similar, to the description, the eyewitness description of the woman. Um, and oh, by the way, she saw the movie a few weeks before um, she described the creature. So, <clears throat> so it's pretty likely that she got the idea for the chupacabra, the, the uh, creature on the left, on the left there, um, from the movie. And so I think that it would have been it would have been great if the museum had had a, a model uh, statue like I've, I've uh, used AI to draw, which isn't very good. Um, model of the actual creature from the movie species, but you get the idea. Um, if they had had that and said, hey, this is this is the model, of, this is a model of the creature from the movie, what do you think? Does it look like the, the creature that she described originally? So I think it was a missed opportunity to teach skepticism. Okay, so now I'm getting to the, the heart of my talk. Are science museums skeptical? Um, I think uh, how, so how, how would we address this question? Well, and, and you see here that um, I wasn't fool, foolish enough to put my wife in the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my original plan was to do content analysis of museum exhibits. And content analysis is a term of art in um, media analysis and things like that. And what it means is that you take some text and you analyze the content. Um, so. You personally, so my plan was to personally visit a large number of science museums and photograph the exhibit panels, kind of like I did um, for, for the museum ones that you saw here. And then assess each of these panels as either factual, um, skeptical, or uncritical or prejudice. <clears throat> so I went to the National Museum of Natural History and I took about 600 photographs and each, each Exhibit panel has an average of about 100 words on it. On it. So yesterday I bought this book in the, in, the, um, in the bookstore, and I analyzed how many words are in that book. It's about 90 to 100,000. So 60,000 60, words just from the 600 pictures that I took at the museum. So that's a lot of text to analyze. Um, so I decided that this was a lot of work, and I was going to put that off. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I came up with a second um, idea. Uh, so do a few of these content analysis efforts, but um, start off with hit count of skeptical words on museum websites. And so hit count is also a term of art. Um, you, you do use it for various, uh, you can look it up. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so so um, what I did was I, if you take the, the term, the keyword site colon and the name of the website name, Google will return all of the pages that match that search, which is all of the pages for that website. So in this example, in the, in the, um, <clears throat> at the bottom I have uh, skepticalinquirer.org. It says there's about 10,300 skeptical inquirer pages. And then on, on the top I have skepticism and that search. So this is how many, um, how many pages of skepticalinquirer.org match the term skepticism, and it's not in quotes, so it also includes skeptical and skeptic. So of course, all of them do because skeptic, skeptical inquirer, skeptical is in the title, and, and so it's on every page. Okay, so, um, but I define that as a skepticism fraction, and, and it comes out to be essentially one. You can do this for other websites, and so if you look at a, a 
various websites. So in this, in this graph, I've got on the y-axis my skepticism fraction, and on the x-axis, I've just got jitter to spread the points out so you can see where they fall. Um, skeptical Inquirer and skeptic.com are right up at one because it's in the name. Um, RichardDawkins.net is about 0.8. The New England Skeptical Society is about uh, 0.6. Uh, skeptic and, and science-based medicine are right at about 0.4. And these, these numbers bounce around depending on when you do it, but you can, you can try it out yourself um, this afternoon at the airport. <laughs> um, okay, so what if, you, what if you look at science magazines? Um, so, uh, so the one, uh, so I've got Quantum Magazine, Wired, Science Magazine, Ars Technica, that sort of thing. You can see that the one in the middle there, the green dot that's the highest, that's Quantum Magazine at about 0.09. Percent, um, and then Wired is down at 0.3. The point is that they, they there's a separation here between the skeptical websites and the science websites. All right. So what about science? Uh, I mean, what about science um, museum websites? Well, they're all right down there, one uh, near zero. There's one exception that stands a little a little bit. The California Science Center. Um, it, it had a couple of articles about COVID-19 and anti-vax anti -vax stuff. Um, so, you know, what you could, what I could potentially use this for would be to go to the California Science Center, take all the pictures, and then do the content analysis of that um, museum because it, you know, it's the best we've got, at least by this metric. Okay, so. Then I have an idea about the content analysis. What if I use AI? And this is this is absolutely insane for anybody who's my age that AI can do this, but here we are. So do the same thing, but go, go photograph the exhibits, um, then feed the, the photos into GPT-40. Um, and, and I did it in two parts. I had to, I had to transcribe the photos into text, and then take the text and analyze it to see if it um, was skeptical, <clears throat> factual, or um, uncredible or credulous. I actually had two different um, prompts for it so that I could um, double check the results and then also manually spot check the results. And I'll show you, <clears throat> I'll show you now what we came up with. Uh, first I'll give you some examples. So these are uncritical or credulous examples from the museum panels. And the first one is the Chupacabra. I'll read you what GPT-40 said. This panel heavily leans on the sensational and speculative language associated with the Chupacabra myth. It emphasizes the mysterious nature of the creature and its alleged sightings without scrutinizing or questioning the validity of these claims. The panel also includes an unverified personal account that adds to the mythical portrayal of the Chupacabra. So, pretty good. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and, it, and I had to do that for all of them, so I have the text of, of how it assessed them. Here's a couple more. So on the left is, <clears throat> is a cartoon of um, some fish that live in the twilight zone. The twilight zone is not so deep that it's always dark, but not too close to the surface. Um, and so I think maybe the term twilight zone is something that caught GPT-40's eye. Um, but it, it is um, anthropomorphizing fish, which is what GPT-40 said. And so, yeah, it's, it's not critical, or it's, it's uncritical. And then the last one here is the um, optical illusions. We talked a lot about optical illusions yesterday. And um, this one is, it looks like Einstein if you're up close and look like Marilyn Monroe when you're farther away. But, um, and, and what GPT-40 said about it is that the panel encourages an optical illusion without explaining the scientific basis behind it, et cetera. Um, and, and I think that this is really important because a lot of museums have um, optical illusions, you know, these lines, they, they look crooked to us, why is that? Um, this dress is, is it white or is it blue? Um, and what they don't get into is the fact that our minds are doing this all the time, right? I mean, we're, it seems like it's some oddity that, oh, oh, look at this, isn't this weird? But really, our minds are doing this all this time, and, and people don't realize that, that this is not an odd. What's odd is that we realize that our minds are doing this. Um, 
um, in the actual evolution. Okay, so, so getting to the skeptical museum panels, um, there were a couple here, that how giant is the giant squid? I'm not really convinced about that one, but it, it, GPP-40 said it encouraged critical thinking. Uh, the one on the left is impossible to read, but it talks about, <clears throat> it talks about um, whether or not meat made humans uh, drove the size of human brains, and there was a, a scientific controversy about that. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, critical thinking. It's, it's a scientific controversy that was resolved. Um, uh, racist or not racist? This one is interesting because it uh, ties back into the you know, Rex Tyson's speech. Um, the Field Museum in Chicago had uh, some sculptures, and they had a, a racist exhibit back in the 30s. Um, but they, you know, they took out the racist stuff and kept the, the, the um, statues, and they were asking whether the statues themselves were racist, um, kind of like what Neil was talking about. Um, okay, critical thinking, I guess. The, the next one here is about whether or not this, um, this parasite aquatic parasite was the basis of the, the creature in the movie Alien. Um, again, I think maybe the, the word alien tipped it off. Um, but <laughs> but um, it, you know, you, there's some critical thinking there, I guess. And then the last one is eating garlic. Doesn't, um, doesn't discourage by the flies and, and eating um, bananas doesn't repel mosquitoes. Uh, ultrasonic pest repellers don't work. Right, that is that is an actual honest to God skeptical um, exhibit. Okay, so here are the results that I got when I ran the whole thing. I did 1,405 exhibit panels. Um, <clears throat> I went to five different museums, including uh, one in Mainz, Germany, when I happened to be there, uh, Chicago Field Museum, the Varhazi Air and Space Museum. National Museum of Natural History and the Franklin Institute. I went to the Franklin Institute because it, when I had done the analysis it was a little bit different way, that one came up as kind of, um, the hit count analysis, that one came up as, as maybe um, worth going to. In any case, five pounds were assessed as skeptical and 13 were assessed as uncritical or credulous. All the rest were identified as factual. Okay, so um, in summary, the science museums I visited this contained essentially no skeptical content. Uncritical and credulous panels were more common than the skeptical ones, and none of the 54 museums' websites suggested that uh, they were skeptical. So that, so I think we need a uh, museum dedicated to science and skepticism. <laughs> um, so I found the Baird Science Museum. <coughs> um, it's, the idea is that it would be a, a museum of science and skepticism, that teaches critical thinking and scientific method through exhibits about pseudoscience and paranormal. And it would talk about how we know what we know and how we avoid fooling ourselves, all the kind of stuff that we have talked about here today. Um, you can visit my website at bsmuseum.org. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it would, you know, it would talk about all this sort of stuff that I just mentioned. Yeah, and so I think we could do this, I, but I need a lot of help from you guys. I need board members, I need 13 board members, I need partner organizations, I need uh, connections. If you know somebody who would be interested in helping, please send them my way. I have uh, work to do on becoming a nonprofit. Um, I have some social media stuff, but, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, I have a lot of exhibit ideas, but I would love to crowdsource this. If you guys have ideas for museum exhibits, come talk to me. Um, You've seen the artwork that I use, so you know I need art artists mm -hmm. and um, you know, funding. Um, yeah, you can contact me at verdenscience.com or you can come to the bsmuseum.org. I just put all my slides up on the website so you can peruse if you want um, at your leisure. And then um, just to give my little disclaimer here, um, um, so th this is all my opinion. Not the opinion of the Center for Naval Analyses or the U.S. Navy, and also um, I'm not trying to disparage any museums. They have their own um, <clears throat> boards of directors and their own mission statements. Right? They're doing the best that they can do. Their focus isn't skepticism, so they're not as skeptical as we might want them to be. That's it.
Thank you so much. And yes, we have questions. So this is from somebody who's the name most people might recognize here. Stephen Huff. Is Stephen Huff here still? <laughs> sent an email that and it said it looks like about 200 articles in Skeptical Inquirer did not include the word skeptical or any variation of it. And he wants to know if you could send him uh, what the name of those articles are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think uh, Google has that run. So, on a more serious note, we have a, a question from uh, the data skeptic, Kyle Polish, who's here. And he said, have you thought about turning your method into a formal score? No one wants to win a Ben Spoon Award, or as when I showed this question to Celestia, she decided it should be named Tabloid Museum Award. Yeah. So, she said, hey, I hope museums would not want low scores and to get that uh, an award. Okay, have you considered developing an exhibit or exhibits for an existing museum instead of creating a new one? Yeah, so the, a, a number of people have suggested that. That's, that's a good idea as well. Um, it, interestingly, the, the Bloodsuckers exhibit is a traveling exhibit. It's, it's no longer in Chicago, it's moving to somewhere else. You can see the whole thing online. Um, there's like a 3D view of it, uh, although you don't get to see all the exhibit panels in detail. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's something I, I thought about. And how did you determine which search term was best to be used for your hit counter? You used the word skepticism. Did you try or consider using anything else? Yeah, so I went, I, I went through, um, that was kind of a, an obsession early on, was trying to, okay, what, how do you optimize the, the words that, that um, separate skeptic, skeptical from, from science um, websites? And I put a lot of effort into that. And Rob was like, can you explain this to the audience? And I'm like, you know, I bet the word skepticism would probably work just about as well. And we did. So I just. <laughs> All right. That's the last question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Scares of plump, I tell you. All right. So let's see what we've got written down here. So this is Carolyn Ogre. Um, she's a retired volunteer, uh, she's a retired teacher, volunteers for various organizations. She's a founder and facilitator the Rational Roundtable, a group promoting science and reason in the Central Valley of California. Okay, so let me see what I was going to say about Carolyn. So, <laughs> um, this woman has stepped up so many times in the various cupcakes and everywhere else you can imagine. She's one of my volunteers for the powerful, amazing, G-S-O-W, and um, I want you to know that this is, the, when, when we're doing these kinds of presentations, it's hard doing this kind of stuff, especially if you're not an extrovert like I am. So, um, you know, I'm very proud of her, and she keeps stepping up, and she keeps saying, I don't know, like, and then she steps up and does it, and we need to find a lot more people like Carolyn out there, so if you are, uh, have any kinds of interest to do anything of this sort, not just doing some behavior, volunteering to help, please let me know and I'll, I'll get you busy. But uh, Carolyn, uh, you're not wearing your Richard Saunders earrings today, which she always wears since I thought that was just, I just would point it out, she'd normally have her Oregonian um, awesome earrings on. But thank you so much and here is Carolyn.
I found a discussed group of the Stockton area atheists and free thinkers called Rational Roundtable. We meet in person every other month to discuss our favorite books, podcasts, articles, topics related to skepticism. And we also participate in community events, and we sometimes take fun field trips. And this spring, we are doing our first Ducky Camp. Our mission, though, is to promote critical thinking in the greater community. So whether that's just our friends, our family, our coworkers, gym buddy, book club, whoever. So to lead by example, I contacted an organization that I volunteer for, which is Ollie at the University of Pacific. It's part of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, and it's held at my alma mater where I got my, my BA and my teaching credentials. And I offered to facilitate a workshop based on Susan Gerbic's creating conversations. But I adjusted it for people outside of the skeptic community as well as our older learners at Albany. And by the way, when I was asked to join the curriculum committee at Albany Pacific, I did so with an agenda to fragment more topics and speakers relating to science and reason. And, uh, uh oh, I missed something. I, uh, there were a lot of various resources that I drew from for this workshop. During 2020, I was already a subscriber to Skeptical Inquirer, and then I started watching Skeptical Inquirer Presents. And I read a lot of the books by the writers and presenters to try to make sense of why so many people I knew were falling for misinformation and what could be done. And I want to give a huge, big shout out to Melanie Teresa King for allowing me to speak to our graphics for my workshop and for all the awesome work that she does. So the main goal was for the participants to gain strategies, to have constructive conversations, and help their friends build their critical thinking in a collaborative manner. I introduced myself as a former ghost hunter, not to copy Kenny Bill, <laughs> but so that participants would recognize elements from my story of oops, why people believe weird things, why they cling to those beliefs, but also that a person can change a lifelong belief. I chose this graphic to introduce the mindset that we're going for. I knew that that last part, viewing the situation as a learning opportunity, would resonate with our Ollie members because a lot of them are retired administrators and educators. So the first objective was just to identify what I meant about this information. So I chose this graphic to explain that this information is often just unintentional, like a, a friend sharing a meme or an email that has false information. Whereas disinformation is a deliberate attempt to deceive and, or, or even just create uncertainty and undermine experts. Malinformation is based on the truth, but it's manipulated, often out of context, again, to deceive. The next objective was to explain why constructive conversations are so important. Some experts in social and political science are concerned about what the effects this increased polarization has on our society and even our democracy. Studies suggest that constructive conversations instead of combative debates and debunking alone might be more effective and even help build bridges in our communities. I discussed the rise of social media influencers spreading disinformation and how contact farms like fake news sites are generating disinformation and are actually sowing distrust in institutions and experts in fields like science, health, and even higher education. I gave a real life example of how debunking and sharing facts and links doesn't always work. And this is from the next door neighbor app. And um, a neighbor wanted to know what these old thingies were showing up on her camera. And um, because she didn't share a picture, I grabbed this off of Wikipedia to show the participants what the neighbor was talking about. 
I told the participants that even after several people told the neighbor that orbs are airborne dust and moisture, and I even posted links to Wikipedia and Skeptical Inquirer explaining about these camera artifacts, just one person said they were spirits, so that's what the neighbor went with because that's what she wanted to hear. <coughs> the next objective um, was to review critical thinking. Um, and I gave them critical thinking uh, skills so the group could recognize flaws in their own thinking, but also in their friends' claims. This part I spent more as an overview. Um, and I included material resources and a handout so the participants could review it and learn on their own. I used fun, relatable examples. Um, I, we're located in Northern California, so we're pretty familiar with Bigfoot stories. So I used this to explain the difference between these terms, and which gullible just means that you accept a, a claim without any evidence, and being a cynic is you just you dismiss it again without any evidence. But a skeptic, of course, as we all know, we either accept or dismiss, dismiss a claim based on the strength of the, of the evidence using critical thinking. And more importantly, skeptics are open to changing their minds based on new and better evidence. I also reviewed some common logical fallacies for the participants to be aware of, um, including these like appeal to emotions. It was important to explain to them that fear and anger actually equals more engagement online, and it fuels misinformation. Um, also on the burden of proof, proof fallacy, how many times have we said, can you know, can you show me where you got this, and well, go do your own research. And of course, the burden is on the person making the claim to give us the source of their information. And then we're all familiar with that from them. Tax, um, usually when there's a lack of a convincing argument, they just devolve into name calling and derisions. I introduced the four techniques of science denial, which is reliance on fake experts as well as denigration of real experts. Logical fallacy, which we just covered, setting impossible um, expectations for science, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories, which are extremely problematic because of how believers rationalize away evidence that might challenge their beliefs. And then there's usually a the nefarious them and um, you know some insidious cover up, right? I also discuss how our beliefs are based on our identity. <coughs> identity, ideology, experience, and expectations, and I emphasize that even smart, educated people can fall from this information and even conspiracy theories. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> I also discuss more factors that can contribute to denial and conspiracy theories for them to be aware of, such as fear of alienation from our tribes, especially if they make us feel important or like we have secret knowledge. Also uncertainty, when there's a lack of information, our brains try to fill in gaps, so um, it, to try to make sense of that situation. And of course, research also shows that trauma and loss can also contribute to our susceptibility to believing conspiracy theories. I shared the crap test that all of us, or many of us, learned in school, but I added lateral reading, or yeah, lateral reading in which you open multiple tabs at the same time to fact check the source and the information. I gave them good fact, fact checking resources and I explained to them that reputable news outlets like um, Associated Press and NPR now have fact checking session, sections. And I showed this to reiterate why good thinking tools are necessary for us to have constructive conversations. So the next objective was just to introduce the, uh, the conversation techniques. I gave a brief introduction to street epistemology, which is a way for others to reflect on their own reasoning uh, through civil conversations and, and rather than confrontational debates. And I just want to touch on something that I heard yesterday, and there is a difference between being polite and being civil. Polite is more superficial, um, and sometimes it, the person might be quiet or even agree with the other side just for nicey nice, right? But you can have civil 
arguments and civil debates. So I use the News Literacy Project's version of pep talk strategy. It's catchy, it's easy to remember, and it stands for patience, empathy, and persistence. And examples of patience is, you know, remind to learn, that, use this as a learning opportunity, not just to throw facts at the other person, be honestly curious and ask clarifying questions, practice attentive listening, and use fact-checking tools together. Examples of empathy is to reserve judgment, try to resist making assumptions about your friend, remember reasons why people could be susceptible to misinformation, and try to find some common ground. And, I, and in persistence, I explained to the participants that this is going to take some time, probably more than one conversation, and you may never fully change your friend's mind, but you want to keep the door open because you don't want to alienate your friend and drive them further into deeper rabbit holes. And the final uh, objective was active particip participation. So I had the participants get into small teams, and they started out with this thought and experiment from Thinking is Power. It was awesome to see their facial expressions with that last question, how would you feel if you were wrong? And by the reactions, I could hear them say, I knew now that they could relate to the empathy part of pep talk. I then asked teams to brainstorm how they could use the steps in pep talk in real conversations with some prompts for me. Comments included, you know, being more mindful of body language, um, not to offer just advice and criticisms, but instead ask a lot of questions, know when to back off or even end the conversation, and how to tactfully ask to see a source of information, as well as being able to tactfully offer to give a link to a different point of view. And of course, thank your friend for the discussion. I then had my teams brainstormed how I could have used pep talk steps with the neighbor who posted the question about the orbs. One suggestion was just to ask, well, what do you think they are? Another asked, since you asked for explanations, why do you keep dismissing them? But another participant recommended changing that to why do you think you are dismissing the other explanations? I chose a relatively non-controversial scenario for the teams to work out on their own, which was a friend recently lost their spouse and is emotionally and financially vulnerable, and they say they want to go to a gallery reading of a famous psychic that they saw on TV in hopes of getting some closure. And of course, everybody got a kick of remembering our friend Karnak. And to save some time, in place of them researching, I gave them background information to consider about psychics, such as gallery readings can be very expensive, and only a few participants actually get readings. And also, we, as many of us know, psychics use hot and cold reading techniques to seem like they have knowledge that they couldn't possibly know. And some psychologists actually suggest that going to a psychic can disrupt the grieving process. So the teams got back together and into one group, and they shared with everyone how they would use the steps with the given scenario with their friend. And one person actually said they did have a friend that went to a psychic, and they wished they would have known these steps to talk to her better. Um, another person said, you know what, I'm way too blunt. I can't go through all these steps. So I said, do you want to be right, or do you want to be effective? And a couple of participants actually spoke up and said, yeah, because they've been really turned off by friends that were way too blunt with them. And one lady kind of made me sad. She said, I wish my children would have more constructive conversations with me. And I said, well, maybe by using these techniques, hopefully moving forward, we'll have better conversations. And I answered any questions I had, and I gave them that handout so that they can continue to learn on their own. And the workshop received positive feedback on the instructor survey with participants saying how important it was for them to learn ways to reach out to their friends. So I was invited to come back and give another workshop as well as an online lecture at All Lake Pacific. And through that, I was invited to speak to our local AAUW and our Rotary Club. So, Going back to skeptical activism. 
you don't have to have a podcast or a YouTube channel to make a difference. As Dr. Eugenie Scott said at SciCon 2017, people need to talk to each other. Science then has a chance to be listened to. And as you've seen, there are great strategies for us to be able to talk to people. We just have to get out there and use them. Thank you for listening. Showing up for the Sunday papers is extremely important because we have amazing talks right now. These are people who have not had a lot of practice speaking on these topics like you normally see on the stage at Saigon. And it was a hard process to whittle it down to these six. And then the process going through uh, Rob and I going and no, I want to, I want this, I mean, we got down to the slides like. I want, the, I want the picture separated, I want names underneath the slides. You know, it's just piddly stuff that I do in Wikipedia, but I, I, I was really pleased. You guys did a fabulous job, you made me very proud of it. I, 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 I want to thank um, Saikon and 
and all of the people of Saigon that will give this a ball and told Rob and I to do this. Um, Natalia and uh, Ray Hall have always done a great job. Ray Hall specifically has done this for years, and we had to move on to Ray Hall. And I guess it's why we think also to Rob and I. And I uh, appreciate the trust that you. I know why they picked you, just because you're such an energy. Johnny's a buddy, and you're involved in everything. And they only picked me so I didn't do a fifth talk in a row. Yeah, that's probably true. So I couldn't pick myself that would be uh, That's true. Um, they've been. <laughs> But the, but the thing is, is that um, this is such a wonderful organization, and uh, I, I tend to lean more to the PSYCOP side. I, I still want to call it PSYCOP. Uh, Cody was just freaking amazing. Anything I asked for, we were, were given. It was wonderful. The um, help they were able to do, they allowed our team to come up here when you guys went to lunch and just walk on the stage and click the buttons and see what it looks like. It's, it can be pretty terrifying for people to do this. And we are looking for more people who want to be able not only to study papers, but all kinds of activities as you can see that our people were able to do. And it's important to be able to do that. Rob, do you have anything that you, any organizations or stuff that maybe, like where can we find your work? Well, so one of the things I've been doing the last several Psycons is doing pre-conference interviews of the speakers and they talk a little bit about what they're gonna talk about at Psycon, but they also talk about their background and we, I tried to keep the book half hour long. I've been Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Simons this year amongst the uh, Raphael Arena. So you can find those on the, the page on the uh, YouTube channel for CSI. And uh, I, yeah, I would recommend even though the conference is over, you still might get a lot of good information about them. And we talked about the other projects the, the speakers are involved in. And the other thing that I, I have um, one foot in the atheist sphere and one in the skepticism sphere. Sorry, Susan. <laughs> But I, I am a helpline agent and ambassador for the organization called Recovering from Religion. I was actually tabling here about that. So what I want to mention is when I became a co-host of their weekly Monday live stream show. And initially it was just mostly uh, humanist subjects, atheist subjects, and I was able to interject skepticism by inviting people like Susan and Mark Edward and Kenny Biddle, and we've had a lot of people come and talk about rational thinking and science to people who were, you know, face it, uh, grew up in a mainstream, but fundamentalist religion, and they're told science is wrong, and there's no need to critically think about anything. So you can find that on the recoveringfromreligion.org page, and there's a thing called RFRX Talks, and it's every single Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We have to do a Zoom meeting. You can talk to each other as well as put questions to the speakers in the chat, and then we do a hangout where the speaker usually stays, and you can talk to them live for several hours. So that's another thing to get involved with. Um, we, well, yeah, you can talk to us. That's, that's true. It's excellent. So um, what I wanted to say is that you guys all got to go see Neil deGrasse Tyson the other night. I didn't get to go see it. I went to go see Matt Frazier. He's at the impeding casino over here. The Wait, beach. Matt Frazier is is the supposed psychic that you have oh, been writing about. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did he feel that you were in the audience? He, he did not know he was coming, even though I registered under my real name. And I wore my jacket with Gerbic on the back. But of course you stay far away from him, so he couldn't get the No, no, I bought the IP passes, and I went right up to his face and, and told him who I was. And I said, hey, Matt, you don't recognize me? And he says, no, I don't. Because it's a meet and greet right before his show. And he comes up to me and he says, I was going to tell the story, but I might as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I walked right up to him. And oh, somebody's, somebody's making motions in the background. I can sort of see in the back. Oh, it's Barry Carr. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll talk to you later because Barry doesn't. And for Barry Carr for putting this all together. Yeah. So thank you for everyone. I guess Barry, you're going to come up and say the last few words. I have a microphone. You can take it. Let her tell the story, Barry. Let her tell the story. All right, tell the story, Susan. Go ahead. Thank you guys for having my back. Uh, so I walk, I'll, I'll do it quickly. And, in, and I will write it up and it will be in the next Skeptical Inquirer um, uh, online probably. Um, so that's where I usually publish most of the time. So, you know, that's cool. But um, 
Oh, I walked up to him, so I had a VIP before this show starts. I paid huge amounts of money to be able to do this. And how, how much was it? Two hundred sixty dollars. Oh, wow. So uh, you always pay top dollar when you're doing these things. Trust me. I've never done a sting where I've been um, uh, not been undercover, I've, and I've always sent people undercover. I've never done anything in our name. But my whole idea was to troll him. So what I did is I went to the thing by myself, and while well, you guys were all in the grass basin, that's so awesome, but mm. I went over to him, I got up, I was the fifth person, he's on stage, a huge stage, and I go in, the room's um, uh, it's VIP, almost all women, and I go up to him, he hugs me, and he says, um, oh, it's so good to see you, and I said, you don't recognize me, Matt? And he goes, no, I don't, and I said, I'm Susan Kerbeck. Remember Operation Peach Pit? This is his expression. Oh! <laughs> it is damn well who I am, by the way. And then I said, you know, from the New York Times? And he goes, oh, yeah. Um, I said, we're here to see your show, because we follow you quite closely. And he says, oh, my wife is pregnant, and my son's over there. Mm. And, and I said, yeah. So we're here to see your show, and and see what you've been up to. So Susan, why do you think he deflected that way and went to the personal house? I think he was just trying, I, I think I really, he was just, his mind was going. Shh. No, 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 you know what he was doing? He, he realized, and he, said, he was basically, don't ruin my life, don't, don't ruin my, my family. family. Don't embarrass me in front of my family. family. Yeah, don't take my I think, I think, I think he was thinking quickly and that he just defaults into something, like, you know, you know. So then he says, um, I said, we'll see you tomorrow, which was last night. We didn't go. But he doesn't know he's not psychic. So I just said, <laughs> so I just said, okay, we'll see. You. We will see you tomorrow. And then I and he said, thanks for supporting the show. And so I walked off and I sat like about where Adrian is to me right now with with a uh, a bright red notebook and pencil and and sat there stoically, um, front center and took notes through the whole thing, I like tons of notes, and I just stared him down, and he kept sneaking peeks at me, and I stared him down, all the readings he did were in the way in the back, and um, and all three, and I, I'm almost done there, I promise, I can't see, but I, I promise, mm -hmm. but what I said is, the whole time I was just kind of like, during the show, I was kind of like looking up at like, like going like this to people. Mm. It's fine. Mm. And then when we left, so he gets off the stage, the place is half full half empty. So I go, he gets off the stage, bye everybody, and people are like, woohoo, cry, cry, oh, bye, bat, whatever. So he goes off the stage, I'm just assuming he's still watching from the back. So I'm like, all right, it's all over. I stand up, I'm stretching, you know, and just doing more exaggerated stuff, like, uh -uh. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the back where people are mingling and getting their purses, and I'm just like, oh yeah. And then I just get up like, oh yeah, it was funny, and I just walked out. But I swear he's not going to have slept well this whole day after that. And I swear he's probably thinking I, I was there writing an article for the New York Times, or I had the New York Times there with me. I don't know what he's thinking. But when my article comes out in a week or two, it'll it'll make sense. You don't know I what think he's thinking, thinking, and he doesn't know what you're thinking. Right. Yeah, he knows. I know what he's doing, and and that was the sad part. But it was very depressing walking by. It's it's hard. It's very hard to do these things because it's emotionally draining because you see the manipulation. And everyone was crying. Everyone was crying. It's really hard. And I'm just staring, I'm like, yeah. There was, I, I can say just this one thing. He did say a cold, he did, he just cold reading. He did say one thing, and that one thing he said was like really clever, a way of getting out of it. You'll have to read the article to see. It's really clever how he did it. And I was sitting there and I said, Oh, awesome! And I wrote it down. <laughs> so he knows, I know. So that's cool. All right, Barry, come on up. So we are married? Yeah, Barry. And I'd like to introduce the reason why we're able to put on this awesome conference. The person behind the scenes is Barry Carr. I really enjoy organizing this conference and actually the last several site cons. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but just the response I've gotten over the last few days really makes it worth it. And uh, you know, thank you, as Susan always says, it's kind of like a battery recharge. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it, you guys really charged my batteries. So, Ooh, sexy. Oh, <laughs> <Well>, Susan. <laughs> so I just want to say, yes, you probably know we're not doing SciCon next year. We're moving to kind of like the summer format. Um, and um, I just could not plan another conference in June of next year to keep it going. So we are moving to June of 2026. We're going to have it in Buffalo where CSI, back then it was SciCon, where it was founded. Uh, it's our 50th anniversary. Uh, and uh, we've already got the hotels and convention centers booked. So uh, it's going to happen. And we want to see you all there. And thank you very much for attending. It's been a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.